Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Unerased Book Club discussion. We are here with the facilitators of the Unerased Book Club, Fatima and Sheila. And tonight we are discussing The Magic Fish by Trung Lui, Trung Lui Nguyen. Um, and the cover of this book, it's a green book with yellow writing. It has sort of a green mermaid drawing in the background and a picture of a young Vietnamese boy reading a book. And before we get started, um, maybe we can just introduce ourselves and give a visual description. Uh, my name is Lucy. I'm a library technician in the youth department. I do programming there, and then I also do programming for adults and teens. And I'm a white woman with long brown hair and glasses. I'm wearing a red and blue shirt and sitting in front of some small watercolor paintings. Uh, my name is Jacob. I am an employee at Ann Arbor District Library, where I work in the outreach department. Um, I am a white male. I got my hair pulled back in a ponytail. I'm wearing a jean jacket, and I'm trying to hide what's in my background, which is a white wall. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll hop in. My name is Beth. I am also in the outreach on the outreach team of the Ann Arbor District Library. I am a white woman with curly dark hair and uh, I'm wearing a pink library shirt that has our branch names on, on it. Uh, anyway, behind me is a plant hanging and uh, my next door neighbor's house in the window. <laughs> my name's Heidi. I'm also an employee at the Ann Arbor District Library in the Archives Department. Um, I'm a white female. I have short I have brownish hair um, and I'm wearing a gray sweater and my virtual background is the Golden Gate Bridge. I can go next. Hey everyone, my name is Sheila. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am um, the founder and co-facilitator of Unrace Book Club. I am um, a light skinned brown woman with short black hair. It's a little bit messy right now with glasses and a black sweatshirt. And behind me is a blurred background of a very messy office. And hi, everyone. I'm Fatima Hawk. I am also a co-facilitator of Annie Ray's Book Club. I also uh, was the C3 board president of Rising Voices, our sponsoring organization. Uh, we organize Asian American folks in the state of Michigan. Uh, and I am a Bangladeshi light skinned brown woman with long black hair and a digital background of pink clouds. So very glad to be here with you all today. We are very glad to have you here. Um, so I will, I will hand it over to you too, to get started with some questions. Yeah, so we can go ahead and just quickly um, summarize the story first before we get into details. Um, this is a graphic novel. Uh, done in a very specific um, art form. Uh, in fo it's inspired by the uh, drawings of the like turn of the 20th century um, cartoons and um, uh, advertisements and, and story tales, uh, story, uh, fables and storybooks. Um, and the book itself is a navigation of a young man, a young boy, uh, he's about 10 years old in the early 1990s, um, who identifies as Vietnamese American, navigating what does it mean to be loved by uh, family? Uh, how, how does he learn to love himself? How does he learn um, about platonic love in ways that are really um, meaningful? And this is uh, explored through different fairy tales, both Western and Vietnamese. So I think that's a great high level summary. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And like we always like to start, just like how how did you like this book? What stood out to you? Um, I I loved this book. I loved it. I this was um, I'd read it before, and I I read it again. Um, and I think that there's so many like wonderful facets of it. So I'm not going to speak to all of them. But one of the things I I really like the most is all the support that this boy has. And like you were saying, Sheila, all these forms of love. And he has, um, you know, a mother who wants to communicate with him and support him and 
for who he is. He has friends who accept him for who he is. And um, there just seems to be a general, there's not a lot of like antagonism and um, conflict around his story. It's just more, to me, it seemed more like how, how are these people going to find common language to communicate who they are? And so I just, I really liked that about the story, both because it's, you know, it's, it's an immigrant story, but also it's, it's a coming out story. And a lot of times I feel like those are framed within sort of a traumatic situation. And so I just really liked about this book that it wasn't. And then, of course, the art as well. The art is so beautiful. Oh my gosh! Uh, I, I want to especially highlight the um, the gowns that some of the fairy tale princesses were wearing were so beautiful and so fun. To, it sounds silly to say so fun to look at. The details would come out, and um, I just thought the art was incredible. Some the, a storytelling device told through art was that like different points of view were told through different color. And I thought that was a really effective way to use the graphic novel to um, to, to tell a story. So I, I, I like the art for um, for its its material its material pleasures, but also because it, um, it it had a functionality as well. Yeah, we had a chance to talk with the author last week um, and he spoke about that, about how that was part of like his editor's suggestions for, for how to help the readers like stay oriented in the story. So I absolutely agree with you. Like it has such an amazing function and very easy to uh, visually be cued into where and what you're reading. I agree that um, that color, the colors, like usually the text or like context of the story had a connection as it shifted between like the present and memories of the past and then the fairy tales or stories. Um, and then here and there, there would be like a panel showing the present moment again, or just kind of shifting in in different really meaningful ways that I think highlight um, just the parallels between like the um, the son thinking about his parents' immigrant experience as well as his own coming out story. Oh, go ahead, Beth. Yes. All right. Yeah, I um, I like the book too. I read it a few months ago and was rereading it in the last few days again. And um, some of the writing is also very beautiful. The descriptions of the faraway places. And, um, but uh, the first, when I, I first read it, then I took a break for a couple of days. And so then when I picked it back up, I was really confused. But then once I understood what the, the how the, you know, the way it's laid out, it, it was a pretty cool way to, um, to tell the story in ways that we all, we can all relate to fairy tales. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we spoke to him last week, we asked about um, like the inspiration for the, the artwork. And it turns out that he uh, studied art history in undergrad and had always like enjoyed that turn of the century visual aesthetic and design, but learned how to, um, I guess, like make that his own in his art. And we asked, what is it like to, to draft and like um, storyline or story, um, I guess outline how you're gonna write this story. And he said, honestly, the most difficult part was the, the language and making sure that it makes sense with the drawings. Because drawings, he like, he knows how to do, he knows how to, um, how to communicate that. And I thought that was so fascinating, especially considering like how reliant this graphic novel is not just on words, but on, the the heavy not the heaviness but the importance of the story and the words themselves yeah i do think that's that's some, oh sorry I was, go ahead i was just saying that's something i always um like about graphic novels but this one in particular where like language was so important um is that it, you're really getting the story on two levels because there's the graphics and then the what they're saying to each other and i like how 
you know, like when the, um, when his mother was speaking in Vietnamese, I think they had these little like marks outside. So it was just very clear about who was saying what and how they were saying it. And I think that's probably very difficult to do in, in a graphic form. Yeah, it's so layered. Him. That's a, and it has multiple meanings. Um, even the colors of the of the different time periods. So, like the past is a different color, uh, representing I think earlier on in the day. Like um, you know, and uh, current times is is the day as well. But then the fairy tales are a darker shade thing representing. So it's just uh, everything being so intentional is really really incredible. I think one of my favorite parts of the book was also just how um, the fairy tale, which are so familiar to us, they're the Little Mermaid, Cinderella, you know, um, these are stories that I grew up with as an American kid. And uh, to, to see it kind of changed and blended in with Vietnamese folk tales, and also at the same time, uh, connected to very real experiences of Vietnamese American experiences of like moving here with, um, and how in the context under which they moved here um, was just so brilliant. I really, really loved that. And I, I don't think that I ever thought of like the Cinderella story or the Little Mermaid and could have made those types of leaps and connections. And so that was really eye opening for me. That leads me to a question for all of you, which is, um, do you, uh, how familiar are you with fairy tales outside of like the Western context? And do you see some of these similarities back and forth? Uh, well, being working at the library, I've, you know, able to, not that I've read them all, but our, the way our folk tales and fairy tales are arranged are by region. So you do see, you know, that there's multiple Cinderella stories. And, you know, so, um, so from that, you know, I've recognized uh, you, that there's a lot of similarity. I recently read a book, which I really loved. Um, I think it's a few years old now, Where the Wild Ladies Are, um, Ayoko Matsuda. And it's like these Japanese short stories that have folk tales or fairy tales woven in. Um, and there's some interesting overlaps. It just it occurs to me now as we're talking about this with um, just something about the message of, of this graphic novel. Um, this sort of uh, line that really struck me, stories change when needed, um, I think is really beautiful. Like just thinking about the different ways these stories map on to different experiences of the characters. Um, and that's what I love about thinking about um, fairy tales adapting and changing mythologies, kind of being adapted in different formats. I think it's really exciting and powerful. For me, the um, the common theme or the theme that I can see crossing over is the theme about stepmothers and and their roles um, in Bangladeshi storytelling. Whether it's modern or fairy tales, um, there are a really common thread of stepmothers as being unkind or unloving or selfish or you know um, like worried about their own power and access to power so they treat their stepchildren um, poorly like that theme um, still exists in media today in modern day Bangladeshi media so for me, like that was very familiar. And so the Cinderella story, I actually read that when I was a child in Bangladesh and um, there was a, like a relative who was visiting from uh, London in the UK and um, and they had brought these kids children's books with them and so that's how that was my first exposure to it and I remember very vividly like being able to relate to that because um, I grew up in my I grew up in a single parent household and there's always this threat of like oh if my dad remarries then I might have to deal with these like 
stepmother, <laughs> you know, like they, this, and the only vision I had of a stepmother is this like caricature that is evil. So it was a persistent worry for me as a child. Um, and yeah, I, I really, um, that's the only real crossover I have. The other ones are like totally different and, and have a different focus. I'm just thinking about something that Lucy said and that um, about how how uh, Tian was treated and like he was always treated kindly. You know, I mean, the fairy tales might have gotten slightly dark, but his life, I mean, the real life stuff was sad. But but um, I kept thinking, like, when's the other shoe going to drop? You know, um, when's the mean stuff going to happen? Because. When's he going to be, you know, tortured? But thankfully he was not. And uh, yeah, it was a really, it was a sweet story. And I mean, multiple stories with lots of layers. I, I, uh, oof. I didn't personally feel like the like bad things didn't happen in the book. Am I... Am I in cuckoo world? I, I know, well, I know. Well, well, I don't I mean, mean to be contrarian. No, I mean like... Like I'm thinking more of his peers. Like he wasn't. Um, he was. He was part of a group. He had a peer group. And um, whereas I was thinking that you know he might. This might be about him being, you know, an outsider. And while he sort of he he was, but he was um, ushered in, you know, to the to the group, to his with his friends and the different, right? Yeah, yeah, because they cared about him. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, but yeah, I think that, yes. yeah, I think that's what like like one of the parts that really stuck out to me was when he asks his best friend Julian, who he has this crush on. He's like, "Are you gay?" And Julian's response is just like, "Hmm, no," you know. And then they just move on and they're dancing together. And it's it's like I just. Um, to see that in a book that's, you know, for like a, a YA book for kids, it's just, I, I liked the idea that people would think that there's that kind of friendship and support out there. But yeah, I think that like within the context of all the, the, the parents story and, um, you know, his grandmother dying, like there are bad things, but I guess I was just speaking specifically of like some really nice, um, parts of like the different kinds of love in the story. And there to add to what you had just said too there's a there's a pleasantness there's like a there's like a general warmth and pleasantness um I, when i was reading it I, I i was i was thinking to myself what do these fairy tales have to do with what's going on in in, in this character's life there's like a lot of different uh, in, in a lot of different ways it's true but in one way i thought in the same way that like in, in the one fairy tale, there's there's violence. This woman, you know, spills blood. In 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 fairy tales, bad things just happen. And also in fairy tales, good things just happen. And and, and the, like the world keeps turning. And I was like, that's kind of like Tien's life a little bit too. It's like wonderful things happen, terrible things happen. But the one thing that's true is that like, keep on trucking. I guess. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, I just want to reiterate: there is that 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 wonderful warmth that that Lucy and Beth you you had brought up, and that is a, such a wonderful part of the book as well. I would add to what you were saying before to Jacob. I mean, I noticed as a gay person myself, I noticed the reference to Matthew Shepard, um, his his death in the late '90s, and that was playing on the TV kind of in the background at some point in the book and then like ultimately the struggle over how he's going to tell his parents or what he's going to say I feel like it was in some ways taken away from him a little bit how that went down um and that was kind of a painful point in the book I felt yeah it wasn't entirely devoid of like harm to a queer person right the, the fact that the the teachers or those who observed him dancing decided to then call in a minister and have that talk and then told his parents I think those are those are definitely signaling um, as well as uh, Matthew Shepard's story like that was the actually 
the thing that cued me into where in time we were, like mm-hmm. where in time we were, because that's such a significant event. Um, and I, I was like, yeah, that's also very much part of the reality. Um, in some ways, it reminded me of Shit's Creek, right? And their approach to queerness being like totally normalized. So even though they're in a small town and, you know, they are, you know, the character, some of the characters are queer and they're just accepted. It is totally the norm that no one's making a big fuss about it. These people dress strange, but they all dress strange regardless of sexual identity um, or gender identity. And people just kind of go in stride. And I remember hearing um, the creator talk about how he really wanted to create a world where people were just accepting that it didn't have to be violent. It didn't have to be painful. And I felt like this book had a similar spirit where it was just warm and Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the super scary, terrible thing that you could find love and acceptance. Um, And I really, really loved that. Um, And it's so refreshing to like, because so many queer narratives are just so depressing and it's tough. (laughs) That's literally what I was about to say to this <laughs> earlier point about this being a YA novel and like still couched in warmth and love and how rare that feels. Um, I'm not like a YA aficionado, but I've read enough to pick up trends on resilience and like showing um, readers that the world is on fire, but you still have to be resilient. And that honestly feels like a really exhausting theme to endure book after book and to have um, a story like The Magic Fish that shows um like how safe an interpersonal relationship can be and how um reliable friends should be or how not all parents are out to be contrarian and many parents just want you to feel loved and supported is such a game it felt like such a game-changing story especially in this broader literary landscape So um, since like the theme of love is such a central part of this book, um, particularly in how it like shows up in people's lives, um, and we really do have the pleasure of seeing love in its many forms. So, so um, we were wondering, in, you know, how how do how do how does this like interweaving of love in all the stories of your own life show up, um, and the way that you tell stories about your own life show up? And I can go first. I mean, I think that some of the stories that I tell um, about, uh, I think a lot of, as a writer, I try to tell stories that really at the end of the day is is around love, right? Um, And I think part of the love that I'm trying to portray is um, is a, a love of individuals and allowing them to be their whole selves, right? And so to show them like, in their fullness, in, in, in their nuanced ways and try to respect and honor that. And um, so that means it's not about me necessarily, it's about um, seeing them for who they are as they are. So I really appreciate that in storytelling in general, but also try to do that in my own storytelling when I try to, when I talk about my own life or the people in my life. Um, I'm I'm reminded how at the end of the book, um, when the mother changes the ending to the fairy tale, and, and she says to her um, son, you know, I might not fully understand this part of you, but I'll get there. And I, and I, I love you, and I, I will continue to love you as such. I think that that is such an important, um, like that made me reflect back on my life and think about people who have done that for me. Um, and it, it made me realize that love isn't like in all of its forms, love isn't just something that um, uh, sometimes you need to consider it. 
or you you need to go i need to i need to understand this more but regardless that love is still there and i think that's such like an honest realistic kind of view on how to treat other people um and it's something that i don't i is the world might be lacking a little bit I really like that you bring that up. Um, there's something that I think it's a conversation I've, I've had in passing somewhere about how children are taught, young children are taught to be nice, to get along, to be friends and to like learn how to share and all those like very positive mutual cooperation skills. But that lesson isn't reiterated as they get older, whether they're like preteens, teenagers or full adults. And we don't have that same sort of uh, conditioning that kindness is a positive thing that it's not a it's not it shouldn't be seen as a trait to take advantage of um, or something that shows weakness and it um i mean this is just a general something about the way that humans decide to to grow but it does boggle my mind that we don't have that reinforcement that love is good and not like the the slogans but what does it mean to show that in practice and how do you reinforce it with people around you and like the stories around us, um, a lot of uh, popular fiction doesn't reinforce that, that like love and kindness is a good thing. Yeah, I think just to um, pick up on that, and it's not like it's not reiterated as as people get older, it's not mirrored either. And I think, um, it, you know, like in, then you look at the way that it is portrayed that there there's like, you see a lot of portrayals of love with conditions and a lot of like the, the books and the movies that we consume, like, even if they feel like these cute romantic stories in the end, like there was a lot of stuff that people had to do to get there that, where they had to either like give something up or I don't know, just, I, I think that the, like the way his mom is talking to him in the end of this book, is just that sort of unconditional, like, you know, you could be anything, but like, I, I love you first and then, you know, we'll go on. Um, and I think you're, you're right, Sheila, like you don't, that's, there's not, that's not talked about and it's not shown, I think, in a lot of things that like a young adult audience would pick up. Yeah, like the, the nice people are you sometimes, you know, laughed at or, you know, the, uh, thought of as foolish or, um, you know, made, made fun of thinking more in movies and stuff. Uh, can't think of any specific book at the moment, but, um, but, you know, there's just like the nice guys finish last trope. <clears throat> Um, going back to the like love and storytelling question, I liked how much this book was just about like stories that pass through the generations. Because when I look at like think about storytelling in my own life, I'm mostly thinking about like my dad and grandpa kind of telling jokes slash stories about what they were up to as kids or with um, family members and that kind of like pass down knowledge. Um, in a way, it wasn't so much like fairy tales, but kind of like uh, Minnesotan humor. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to speak to two different coworkers today. One who brought up that um, they were raised in an intergenerational household, and the and this was um, the Spanish. The, sorry the Spanish speaking side of their family. And so when those family members passed away, there was this real heavy loss of not just family, but culture and that institute, cultural and familial knowledge. Um, so Heidi, your, your story about your, your family, it just like resonates with that other conversation I had today and kind of to the, to the book, um, the aspect of forced migration completely cuts off any attempt at um, passing along that familial knowledge and just how you can tell like how painful that separation is for Helen, but I would love to have seen um, maybe an exploration 
a hypothetical sequel um, of what does that storytelling look like for Tian as he gets older? Um, and then I, the other co a coworker I had a conversation with identifies as a queer Vietnamese American, and they read this book as well and said that this was the first book that they had seen about the Vietnamese American experience that did not center trauma um, and that um, actively displayed and showed the impact of different languages between generations and what is lost and um, what is unspoken or what is said through what is unspoken. And I thought that was really powerful to hear from somebody who like is very emotionally close to this story. I have a question for folks who may not have been raised with fairy tales. Like I wasn't really raised with folk tales. Um, I mean, I had like the library book fairy tales um, growing up, but it wasn't ingrained. But how do you think that if you have younger people in your life, whether they're your children or nibblings or, or just friends, kids, how you'll reinterpret stories for them? I grew up obsessed with fairy tales. I remember when I found out that fairy tales were actually violent, I was like, let me get that book really quick and let me read them all because the, the, I, I didn't, the, Disney didn't do it for me. But um, I kind of being older and reflecting on why I was obsessed with fairy tales is because I think a part of it, for me at least, is growing up queer, not seeing like myself in any stories, but fairy tales exist for, for, for almost for that reason. He, he, they're almost blank canvases for you to put parts of yourself into the story. And I think that's what I really ended up connecting with, with fairy tales. Um, some of the authors said at the end of the book was how fairy tales, uh, in the same way that me being queer and, and, and I can connect to fairy tales, he used fairy tales to tell an immigrant, an, an immigrant story for that similar reason. And I thought that was cool. Um, so, yeah. So I, um, for a while, when I was traveling, I would try to pick up uh, folk tales from like collections of folk tales um, in translation in different places. So I have, I have them from all around Asia, um, and have been reading them and kind of seeing like, okay, where are the similarities to my own culture or to what I know of American fairy tales, um, and and there's a surprising number of overlap, but I think where it really connected was. Um, as I've, I have three nibblings um, and as I've been reading to them and making up stories with them in mind because they all have Muslim names and none of the fairy tales have Muslim characters and, uh, and don't even look like it. My niece for the longest while just wanted to, she's like, no, but the princess has the blonde hair, like frozen and, you know, like that kind of thing. So trying to reimagine, reinterpret um, for them and making up stories. So when in this book, one of the things that um really, it's a very small detail, but it touched me was when um it, when his mother says you know don't change the words like i want to know exactly what's written because that's something i'm constantly doing where i'm changing the words and i'm changing some of the names or some of the details because i want you know when they're able to read for themselves they'll know the truth but in the meantime i will be sharing my version of it um and actually that's been kind of a fun challenge for me it's just like how do i do this um, and it's also made me think about like, well, like, would I like if I were to write children's books, which I don't think that's within my capacity, but if I wanted to just for my nibblings, like, what would I write um, and how would I include them? It's a it's a fascinating little like thing that just always running in my head. I was, um, you know, I've, I've raised two kids and now I've got a grandchild and one on the way next month. Um, and so even I can remember with with my daughter, my gosh, she probably wasn't even three years old when I took her to see um, 
Snow White. It was either Snow White or Cinderella. Either way, I remember getting out of the car with her and going, you know, you, you don't need to have a man to, you know, make you happy. And or I don't know what I said. How could I have been? And she's like, I know. <laughs> What would she have known at that age? But anyway, as now that I've, with the younger, uh, you know, with Olivia reading stories to her, you know, I definitely change some of the gender sometimes. And um, yeah, you can do whatever you want when you're reading a book to, you call them nibblings. So um, it's cute. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So uh, change it up, you know, um, different last names, different, all of it. That's, that's what you can do you know, with fairy tales too. And and I will give credit to Adrian Marie Brown for coining the term nibblings, which uh, is uh, children of my siblings. So it's a gender neutral term to talk about nieces, nephews, and, you know, um, other gendered. So, so uh, yes, that's oh, very that's, lovely. Yeah, nice. Okay, I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I would, I was thinking like, um, when I would, my kids are like in early twenties and late teens now. Um, so when I was reading these kind of stories to them, um, like specifically my, you know, well, not specific, specifically my daughter, but, um, she was a, a really early reader. And so it was really hard to fight against that sort of Disneyfication of all of these stories. And, and she wasn't someone that even like from a very, the youngest age that you could really pull one over on. So if you switched up anything, she's like, ah, no, that's, you didn't get that right. So I just had to kind of, you know, avoid that. But the thing is that no matter what you're doing in your own space, like if you send your kids out into the world, that is the general way that I think fairy tales are portrayed. And then there's all these children who are so disappointed to learn that like the little mermaid really dies. And, you know, the, the true, like you're saying, Jacob, the true violence behind them, which to you was an appeal and might be to a lot of kids, but we have just sort of removed that. Um, so like, that's, you know, I, I just remember more a frustration with the stories, um, which were the stories that I, I heard too, you know? Um, yeah. Actually, like I, I, when I was teaching in women's studies, um, the, one of the fascinations that students kept having, like as we would go over a lot of these concepts, is reinterpreting Disney stories and also talking about about it. So I remember one particular group of students actually did a pro their project on that, which was to break down. <laughs> A lot of the gendered stuff, and and it's still to this day. If you look on TikTok, if you look on any sort of like social media, um, this is a point of fascinations for a lot of people, um, young and older, who just wanna, you know, whether it's like, here's what lives of Disney princesses would be like if their mothers were alive, or you know, just any number of things. It just it, completely changing the story and the dynamics of it. Um, and I love that interrogation. I think that it's really cool that people are kind of coming around to seeing it and really being like, hmm, that's not quite right. <laughs> Whether it's from a gendered perspective or a colonizing perspective or from, you know, anything else. Yeah. And to that point, Fatima, about like the colonizing impact, um, I just think that maybe one of the reasons there aren't that many exported or talked about Indian fairy tales um, is because it's all Western fairy tales. Um, and then it's all specifically Hindu mythology, but there's no in between. And I don't really have a, an end to this, but it is curious where those folk tales reside that are accessible and not made to for older children. Um, so the last like prepared or um, question that we've we've asked any of our readers to think about, and we've already sort of talked about it, but um, I'd love if folks have more in-depth perspectives is uh, Magic Fish highlights how language and cultural context impacts Tian and Helen. What do these mean for your own family and community?
I'm sorry, could you say that last line? What did what? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, um, the book highlights how language and cultural context impacts Tian and Helen, especially in how they do or don't communicate. But what do language and cultural context mean for your own family and community? And I can give an example. Um, I think that um, I, I can talk about like the relationship I have with my dad versus the relationship my brother has with my dad, where even though we're very close in age, for some reason, I've been able to pick up, even at a, at a, as a younger child, pick up on the idiosyncrasies and what my dad is saying, even though he speaks fluent English, he was still born and raised in Southern India with a very different cultural context. And I was raised in mid-Missouri. So it's not like I was raised in India either. Um, but somehow like through osmosis, that fundamental understanding came to me and maybe it didn't to my brother. And so there's this huge disconnect in how my brother understands my father versus how I understand him. It, that sound, to me, that sounds like just a little more empathy on your part that, you know, not everyone has and not everyone's able to um, yeah. step in and, you know, and it's can be a curse, right? Sometimes it's too annoying because I get like that too. Just like, you don't want to, you know, you just feel, you feel a lot. You got all the feels. Um, uh, so in my family, well, I don't know. I was just thinking, I'm thinking more about my daughter and son-in-law and um, there, he, my son-in-law's uh, Arabic family and uh, we're Jewish. So, but, so their family, you know, they're, they have my, my granddaughter, my grandkids are going to be Arab American. So, I mean, they are, so that's, I don't know. It just, um, I just think about it in that context, I guess, like, you know, I was raised in, uh, my family came from Eastern Europe. And so, you know, just really different kinds of um, uh, experiences. And with this other, you know, as people join together, um, that's what happens. And I think that's really the beauty of, of the world that we live in, you know, that we are able to do that um, and, and have a good mix in, a, in an ideal situation, you know where it can be good like that. Yeah, that question's a really vulnerable question and I recognize that this is being recorded. So it's totally okay if people don't feel comfortable responding. Um, it just felt like a really important plot point for um, a crux of the story. Um, and I was hoping just generally readers would reflect on what does it mean to come from any family where there's just cultural differences between generations, whether it's language or religion or sometimes political, but um, socioeconomic, like there's so many different ways that generations shift and change. And the language around those changes um, may be inaccessible to previous generations. It makes that relationship a little bit harder to, to develop. I think it's not even so much that it is inaccessible as there isn't proper models for it, you know? Um, I with So two of my nibblings are biracial and, um, and I, I think, you know, as, as I've been involved in, in them growing up, one of the things that I've asked a lot of other people is, well, how do you, I want them to know Bengali, like, how do I, how do I do that? And so that was actually a question that I've asked of a lot of people I know who have, um, multiracial families, right. Um, or multilingual families. And one of the advice that I got was like, refuse to talk to them in English. Like if they're not speaking to you in Bengali and you're not responding in Bengali, just refuse. Um, that doesn't turned out for me, at least that didn't work very long because I'm like automated to like English is, has become my primary language. Um, and also once they know that you understand it, they, 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 they refuse to. So with my niece, um, 
she will speak to myself, my brother, and my dad in English regardless, right? But with her mother, she immediately switches to Bengali because she knows her mother's grasp of English is, is not as strong as the rest of us. And, and kids kind of intuit that. And, and I think they're just going to navigate in and around that as best as they can. And I've had to let it go a little bit and hope that other pieces of cultural things um, catches up to them or, or that is something they develop over time. And hopefully they don't blame me later on the way that I've blamed my family at times for not passing along certain cultural knowledge. I think I have a lot more empathy for them now because I imagine that as a kid, I might have been really hard to teach. I just wish there was more space for multiple languages within kind of popular culture, just a lot of different contexts in the US. Um, like kids aren't really, unless you know you find the right schools or, or what have you, um, if you don't have a multilingual household or, or family members, um, opportunities for, for kids to learn other languages. Like I feel that lack in my own childhood. I wish I'd, I don't know, had the chance or, or happened upon some kind of way to, to do that without kind of, um, I, I didn't really know what to do, do it for myself at the time. So um, I just wish there was more space for that. Um, this is one of the reasons why when Jane the Virgin came on TV, I really, really appreciated it because it was one of the first TV shows I've seen where that sort of like language um, like uh, was portrayed on screen, right? Like Jane's grandmother um, would only speak in Spanish, but Jane would speak to her in English. And it was very clear that she understood English. She just chose to respond in Spanish. And to be able to actually see that, that was so so incredible. And I felt really like, oh my gosh, yes, that, you know, um, and I hope that like more, we get more of those on-screen representations at the very least that, that normalizes this sort of like um, moving between languages and, and occupying those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to, um, to your point, to Heidi that um, like that sort of lack of, of um, providing kids with opportunities to learn multiple languages in this country. Um, where I've seen that like a lot, even at working at the library, you, I think you see that there's so many people that come in there who have to um, try to change the way they speak or, or figure out what they're trying to say in order to get what they need. Um, and it's not, this is not library specific. I'm just thinking of interactions between people in our culture. And I think it would be great if, if like more people could meet those people where they are. So instead of people having to try and speak English or, you know, that, that it just, um, I imagine like, that just seems like it would be so isolating all the time. And so if languages were something that, you know, everybody was learning more of them and more aware of the importance of not just speaking like this one language that um, it would be great because people could just be meeting each other where they are. Uh, that makes me think of, um, we talked about this in yesterday in a training, but, uh, but it's been mentioned um, that everyone should learn ASL. There's no reason that we don't all speak it. Why we all could learn it. I mean, you know, and I've, I had learned it at one point in my life and could pick up on it, but, but um, there's no reason that a segment of our, of our world should be left out of conversation, you know? And to that, I mean, there, I've seen, I mean, granted it's social media, so I don't know how prevalent it is, but I've seen more and more parent creators showing their kids, um, using sign language to, cause like babies can't speak, but they can sign, they can communicate that way. And while it's not like, it doesn't center people who are hard of hearing or deaf, it is an avenue to um, increasing the number of ASL users. And you're right, like it's truly bizarre that that is not um, 
even offered as a second language or included as primary curriculum to um, just recognize that there's a massive population that would benefit from other people knowing and being able to bridge that gap. Yeah, I think we all, in our, in our family, um, since I learned some signs so long ago, you know, when, when we've had to go to the bathroom, my husband, you know, we'll, we don't have to say it. And my granddaughter is learning signs. And um, so that's also really, really sweet. And um, it just, yeah, it, it just helps functionality when you can communicate, uh, no matter how it is you're doing it. So I'm hearing a call for like advocating to your school boards about curriculum and and I would support this sort of a change as opposed to some of the other recent trends we've seen. So go to a school board meeting, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's my oh, right. Man, I don't know. They they go all night, don't they? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. It reminded me of um, a moment in in the book when the mermaid in the fairy tale arrives in like on land, I guess, but she can't speak. And I, that was kind of new to me for the Little Mermaid story. But um, I didn't pick up on it when I was reading it. But I read like the afterward part where the author talks about like arriving in a new country and not knowing the language, um, and that just all kind of like it kind of brings it home in another way besides it being a language issue it's like about like being able to speak and communicate mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that like seems different to me but it like hit home in a different way I had a question for the folks at the library um as a, I'm not a baby, nor do I have a baby, I am not familiar with baby book selections. Um, but I'm curious, what does like the bilingual section look like? How have you seen it change over the, the however long you've worked in the library system? Um, I mean, we have like in the youth room, you know, I'm thinking like specifically our downtown location where um, Books are, <clears throat> books are available to kids. We do have books in a lot of different languages and I have seen more and more board books, like the earliest books um, coming out in, in multiple languages. And sometimes it's the same book in, in multiple languages, which is really great because then that's an opportunity to teach children, not just the language that maybe you speak in your house besides English, but you're using the same pictures and then you're having multiple languages to do that. Um, and that's a really great format for introducing that early on because just these, you could have an English word and another language side by side. But then if you even took a third book, you don't even have to have the, the English piece in there necessarily. So that is something that I've noticed um, with word books coming out, like the, for the earliest, earliest books that you're going to introduce, which I think is good. <laughs> that's really neat. I just, I mean, growing up there were no books in hindi um for me so my first introduction was a constant repetition of letters and like the same words that go with the letters but nothing that was at the appropriate reading level so i never could translate the, my literacy to actual comprehension um and like my, my husband speaks hindi and punjabi reads hindi um can't read punjabi but his one of his worries is like if when we are able to have kids that that will be lost in translation to another generation. I'm like, I already lost it and I turned out fine. It's okay. <laughs> but I mean, that's, it's really good to know that there's such a um, emphasis or there's much more effort put into creating multilingual books for children to meet them where they're at with their comprehension levels. Also do not discount uh, YouTube and apps. Um, it actually has been the way my niece has been learning Arabic and Bengali um, because she's like, there are specific shows that are just for like, here's how you learn the alphabet and here's what you, you know, all of that. So um, I still, I've yet to get her to, uh, to love the Bengali version of Sesame Street as much as I do, but we're working on it. <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, so we're about at the top of the hour. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, is there any last thoughts or anything that you want to share about the book? Anything that you didn't get a chance to talk about? I would just say thank you for, for choosing this book because I, I just um, love it. And I'm also a huge fan of graphic novels. Um, I just think that they're so immersive and like so multi-layered. And so I'm always happy to see those on, on reading lists. So all well, credit goes to Sheila, so thank you. <laughs> um, next month, we will be reading a play, uh, ooh, The Brothers Paranormal. Um, I just picked up my copy from the library today, uh, and uh, it's a really tiny short book. It's a Thai author, um, and I'm really, really curious to, to get into it. So um, hopefully we'll see you next month. Yeah, thank yeah. you, everybody. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank for you. Much. Yeah. Okay.